We're grateful for your presence. We ask that you would please take the registration pad in the pew and sign that. If you're visiting with us, know that you're our most welcome guest, and we're so grateful that you've chosen First Methodist in which to worship this morning. A couple of announcements to call your attention to. If you'll look at the front of Huntsville First, at Huntsville First. You should have received that as you enter, entered this morning. This evening, 5 p.m., we'll be having confirmation service. It's a wonderful time. 47 people will be confirmed, our young people. Several baptisms, the receiving of new members. It will be a grand evening in the life of our church, and we hope that you will be here. Also, on Wednesday night, we will be having a Thanksgiving meal our first Wednesday night supper of the month and we'll have Thanksgiving meal together. If you have not registered and would like to come, please call the church office to register. Our internet system or our registration system is going to be down for a couple of days. We want you to come. We would like for you to be here. We hope you'll join us, but please call the church office to make that reservation. As we gather on this All Saints Day, Pastor Glenn comes to lead us in our time of remembrance and celebration. I invite you to turn to the back of your worship folder this morning. As we come to All Saints Sunday, it is a day that is bittersweet for us. It is a day that we remember and celebrate the loved ones who've gone on and are closer in their walk with God than we can ever know here on this earth. And so we celebrate and give thanks to God for their lives. And at the same time, it is a difficult day as we remember all the joy and love that they brought to us that is now gone and waits for us for that day when we all shall gather together again. This morning as we move through this, there is a litany for us as we begin. And then we will call the names of the saints of this congregation who have died in the last year. As we call these names immediately following, we will respond with thank you Lord for this your faithful servant. And then there will be a chime that will sound the acolytes will light a candle. We invite a member or members of a family, if you are here, to please come forward if you would like and receive that candle and take it and place it in the windows. This is symbolic for us. As the lights of the candles already shine in the windows, we add to the light of the lives of those saints among us as they will surround us, as they will be a part of our lives and continue on forward. I also would say to you as members of the congregation, if as we call a name, someone is special to you, a friend, family member, or someone you care about, you may also stand at your pew in honor and memory of that loved one. So I invite you to prepare now to celebrate and remember we will ask our acolytes to meet our pastors at the table, and we will invite Stephen ministers who are here to come as they may also be called upon to carry the candles to the windows. Let us join together now in our litany of remembrance and celebration. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, Blessed are the dead who from now on die in the Lord. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Let us remember with gratitude those who have lived and served among us. Alice Smith Abbott, thank you, Lord, for this, your faithful servant. Chris Sonny A.G., thank you, Lord, for this, your faithful servant. J. 
Judith Lewis Austin. Thank you, Lord, for this, your faithful servant. John Kendall Black, Jr. Thank you, Lord, for this, your faithful servant. John Bell Edmund Chase, thank you, Lord, for this, your faithful servant. Bernice Kirk Choate, thank you, Lord, for this, your faithful servant. John Raymond Ray Conway, Jr. Thank you, Lord, for this, your faithful servant. David Allen Cooper. Thank you, Lord, for this, your faithful servant. Charles G. C. G. Crawford, thank you, Lord, for this, your faithful servant. Sherry Bradley Steffi Crenshaw, thank you, Lord, for this, your faithful servant. Walter G. Walt Crompton, thank you, Lord, for this, your faithful servant. Esther Louise Depew, thank you, Lord, for this, your faithful servant. Judith Wade Judy Esslinger, Thank you, Lord, for this, your faithful servant. Bibi Ann Fleming. Thank you, Lord, for this, your faithful servant. William Aubrey Bill Fondren. Thank you, Lord, for this, your faithful servant. Adelia Huffman D. Gibson. Thank you, Lord, for this, your faithful servant. Frederick Eugene Fred Gilmore. Thank you, Lord, for this, your faithful servant. Nan Peggy Gilstrap, thank you, Lord, for this, your faithful servant. Janine Patchen Glover, thank you, Lord, for this, your faithful servant. Rebecca Lee Becky Hamilton, thank you, Lord, for this, your faithful servant. Charles Chuck Greer, thank you, Lord, for this, your faithful servant. Nancy Lee Granny Holmes, thank you, Lord, for this, your faithful servant. Christopher Stephen Chris Kuffner, thank you, Lord, for this, your faithful servant. Thomas Jackson Jack Lee, thank you, Lord, for this, your faithful servant. Helen Charlene Lockhart, Thank you, Lord, for this, your faithful servant. Thank 
Douglas James Doug Lowther. Thank you, Lord, for this, your faithful servant. Phyllis Marie Luce. Thank you, Lord, for this, your faithful servant. Raymond Stivender Ray McLaughlin. Thank you, Lord, for this, your faithful servant. Sarah Wood Mullins. Thank you, Lord, for this, your faithful servant. Cheryl Lou Parton. Thank you, Lord, for this, your faithful servant. John Stetler, Jack Patterson. Thank you, Lord, for this, your faithful servant. Ralph Edward Perkins. Thank you, Lord, for this, your faithful servant. William Self Bill Probst, Sr. Thank you, Lord for this your faithful servant. Barbara Jean Rast, thank you, Lord, for this your faithful servant. Amanda Thrasher Segrist, thank you, Lord, for this your faithful servant. Claudia Pearson Travis, thank you, Lord, for this, your faithful servant. Alfred Lawrence Al Watson, thank you, Lord, for this, your faithful servant. Jeanette Randall Watson, thank you, Lord, for this, your faithful servant. Ronald G. Ron Wiesner, thank you, Lord, for this, your faithful servant. Maveline S. White, thank you, Lord, for this, your faithful servant. Sybil McDougall Wilkinson, Thank you, Lord, for this, your faithful servant. Scott Michael Williams. Thank you, Lord, for this, your faithful servant. As we enter into our time of prayer this morning, our prayers are not only for ourselves, but for all of these saints, and especially for all of their families. Let us pray together. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Eternal and everlasting God, You are the God who has seen us to this point, and you will see us to eternity. We come humbly bowing our heads and our hearts before you, acknowledging that we need you every day. We are grateful, and we thank you for the lives of your saints. And as surely as we are grateful for their lives, O oh God, we offer a prayer in this moment for their families. May your Holy Spirit come and bring comfort and peace. May your Spirit give them insight and a vision of the day that is coming when we shall all be together again at your table.
Lord, we come before you this morning. You have given to us your son, Jesus, and we seek to follow him. We fail, we stumble, we miss the mark, and yet your property is always to be gracious. Your love for us will never end. And so we ask for you to rain down your love upon us again this day. Give us the wisdom we need to make good decisions. Give us the hope we must have to realize that you are continuing to work your will in the lives of your people. And Lord, give us strength. Give us strength to face these days unafraid. So, Father, we bow before you, praying for you to lead us and guide us as a church. Be with your people here and across your world. Help us to raise up the name of Christ ever higher than before. And, Lord, as we gather this day, we are not sure how we should pray. But we remember the words of Jesus how he taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please remain standing for the reading of the scripture. Our scripture today is from 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, and verses 11 through 12. You may follow along in your pew Bible, page 193, if you wish. The members of the young Thessalonian church were being persecuted by the local authorities because they were Christians. And they were also being confused because of different teachings about Jesus. So the elders of the church wrote to Paul <coughs> expressing their self-doubts that their church could endure and survive these pressures. Paul responded with this letter of praise and encouragement. <clears throat> Paul, Savannah, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, as is fitting because your faith is growing abundantly and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast of you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions which you are enduring. To this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his call and may fulfill every good resolve and work of faith by his power, so that in the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, choir. How beautiful. For all the saints, Thank you, saints of God, as we have shared in a very intimate litany and communion of saints as you have come forth, taking the light of God in the life of saints who have gone before us and taking them to a place to where we are now surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. 
those for whom we are truly thankful. We begin that series today that will take us to three weeks from Thursday where we'll be sitting at our Thanksgiving tables. A series we have entitled Being Thankful for One Another. Are you thankful for one another even when you're not thankful for one another? Today, we get to touch base with that for just a moment. I'm thankful for our ministers. Four there are seated behind the lectern. Our acolyte, who is a minister, bringing the light of God. Pastor Beal, Mr. Joe, who is a Stephen minister and a first care minister, and Pastor Glenn. Pastor Glenn, that young man, has invited this old retired Methodist preacher to come back and preach today. <laughs> thank you, Glenn. I thank God for you. And for you, and for those whose names are on the list we read today. Let me ask you, have you ever received a note, a letter, an email message, a text message, a tweet, whatever that is, <laughs> from someone who was just thanking God for you. That's all. They were just thanking God for you. Maybe the more important question is, have you ever sent a message to someone just to let them know you are thanking God for them? Such notes and emails and messages and texts and tweets can make a difference in someone's life. We now have so many ways to communicate with family and friends, but in biblical days, the methods of communicating our gratitude and thanksgiving for one another were rather limited. The Apostle Paul took a pen, a quill, wrote it on a piece of paper, and, and it, perhaps it took weeks or years for it to even to arrive at his intended audience in Thessalonica. But the apostle said, and they finally got the text message, we, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, must always give thanks to God for you. It is like a debt. That word even is in some of the translation. It's like a debt. We owe them our thanksgiving. And on this day, we pay a little bit of our debt of thanksgiving to those who are now the church eternal. We read their names. You know, this text messaging thing can get you in trouble. A guy by the name of David received a text message from his mom who had not yet learned all the text language. And David's mom sent a message to David and said, Your great aunt just passed away, LOL. David texts back to mom and said, Mom, why is that funny? And mom texts back to Dave and said, It isn't funny, David. What do you mean? David said, Mom, LOL means laughing out loud. And mom said, Oh, my goodness. I sent that to everyone in the whole family. I thought LOL meant lots of love. I've got to call the whole family back. And thus she did. Whether we're saying, Hey, lots of love or laughing out loud, or crying out loud. We join the apostle today when he says, we must, we ought, we have a debt to give thanks to God for you. Can you bring to mind those in your life whom you can say, we give thanks to God for you? We don't have to look very far today, do we? Just the names that we've read just creates a sea of emotion, laughter and tears and everything in between of those 40 names we read and other names we read in our other services. We find ourselves so appreciative of who they were, who they are, and who they will continue to be to us. Very thankful. Appreciative. Of what? 
Why do we give thanks to God for these saints? Paul says, because first of all, faith is growing. You're growing faith. In that same sentence, he says, your love is increasing. And then he says, right in the middle of the hardships, right in the middle of the difficulty, right when it gets tough, your faith is growing and your love is increasing. Have you ever noticed that life can get hard? Sometimes really hard, especially when our loved ones are beginning to take their flight and go on home to Jesus. Sometimes it can get really exhausting. Yes, it can get hard. Coming home from his little league game, a little boy swung open the front door very excited. His dad, unable to attend the game, immediately wanted to know what had happened at the game. So, how did you do, son? The daddy asked. You'll never believe it, dad, the young fellow replied. They told me I was responsible for the winning run. Really, dad asked. How'd you do that? The little boy said, I dropped the ball, and the other team scored the winning run. I was responsible for the winning run. <laughs> you know, there's such a sense of purity when it doesn't matter if, if it's win or lose or whether you're just there in the game and, and you're thrilled that you had a part. That's what we're celebrating today. They had a part. We had a part in that relationship. And the apostle affirms that sometimes it can be a little hard. 2,000 years ago, he said to that congregation, you're so steady and determined in your faith, despite all the hard times that you've come through with your loved ones, with each other, and the hard times you're facing right this moment, in spite of dropping the ball on a regular basis, you have stayed in the game, you have remained steady, you have been determined in your faith, you have continued to believe in the Lord. Paul was blessed by those people who were being faithful in the hard times. Faithful in the hard times is very, very often the calling. Some of you will know the name of Larry Bird. As of 2019, Larry Bird is the only person in the National Basketball Association NBA history to be named Rookie of the Year, Most Valuable Player, uh, NBA Finals Most Valuable Player, All-Star Most Valuable Player, Coach of the Year, and Executive of the Year. The only one, the only one in NBA. Nicknamed the Hick from the French Lick, Larry Bird was widely regarded as one of the greatest basketball players of all time. Larry was the third of six children, five boys and one girl. His father was chronically unemployed, an alcoholic who ultimately took his own life when Larry Bird was in high school. Larry's mother was a strong, proud woman who held her family together, often through hard times working three jobs. The family was close-knit and devoted to one another. If one of the children was ridiculed for wearing shabby clothes, the others would go on their defense of their brothers and especially that only sister. As early as junior high school, Larry Bird's love of basketball was very obvious. He'd stay for hours after a game just practicing over and over the shots he had missed or the balls he had dropped during the last game. Unfortunately, he was so passionate to achieve that he was sometimes unable to control his temper under pressure on the basketball court. This led to a series of angry outbursts on the court during his eighth grade year. One day, his coach told Larry Bird that he'd gone too far and could no longer be on the team. Larry Bird was an devastated eighth grader. Basketball meant everything to him. However, 
this jolt, this disappointment, this hard time in his life made him reevaluate his attitude about life. He refocused his energies on new goals and made the team again, becoming a star on the French Lick Spring Valley High School team. Larry's next big challenge was going to college. He got a scholarship at Indiana University, a source of pride for the whole town of Little French Lick to come from a small town and play for the legendary coach Bobby Knight made Larry a local hero instantly. But you know, Larry felt out of place at Indiana University, for you see, French Lick had a total population of only 2,000 people, and here he was in a university of 30,000 students, a school 15 times larger than his hometown. And just one month passed, and Larry became so homesick, he left school. And basketball legend Larry Bird went home to be a garbage collector. Hard times? Yes. A year later, Larry Bird enrolled at Indiana State, and the rest, as they say, is history. He led Indiana State to an NCAA Finals where he lost to Michigan State, led by a, game, a guy by the name of Magic Johnson. Larry went on, though, to join the Boston Celtics, 13 years, became an NBA and Olympic basketball champion. He was voted most valuable player several times. Later, he served as head coach of the Indiana Pacers. Sometimes it gets hard. Sometimes we think people who rise to places like that got it easy. We sometimes don't know or forget how much some of our heroes have overcome. Those whose names are on our list today, they told me, some of them shared with me how difficult it was from time to time. We admire those people. So often, faith grows and love increases through the hard times. We admire people who overcome. Notice how Paul says, we thought that experience in Asia was going to kill us. We thought we had been sentenced to death. As it turned out, it was a good thing. It was something that caused our faith to grow and our love to increase. It wasn't bad. It wasn't the end. It was the beginning of a new life and increase in faith and love for one another. In that 12th verse that Joe read so well for us, it says, So the name of our Lord Jesus will be glorified in you and you in him According to the grace, one of the translations used the words precious grace. According to the precious grace of our Lord, according to the precious grace. Paul begins with the word grace. He ends with the word grace, which is a way of saying, I thank God for you. Because it's God's grace that allows our faith to grow. It's God's grace that allows us to love one another more. And it's God's grace that gets us through those hard times. That precious grace. Another verse that strikes me when Psalms 116 in verse 15 says precious Precious grace, the psalmist says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Precious. We usually re reserve that word for little children or for tonight, the compromands, they're just precious. We usually reserve that word for those in that age group. But the psalmist says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. I got a little bit more of a personal touch of that this year. 
just a few weeks ago, about 60 years ago, I met a boy who would become my brother-in-law. His name is Jerry. A little more than 50 years ago, he married my sister. He was drafted into the Army and volunteered to serve with the 173rd Airborne Brigade. Someone said, if you want to survive Vietnam, you need to volunteer and get in a good unit. He raised his hand, unfortunately, for the Airborne Brigade. After he finished his training, their first child was born, a daughter. Regina was her name. When Regina was about six weeks old, Jerry left for Vietnam. That little girl and my sister lived with us at home during that year at war. I was 14 years old. When he returned from the war, he was still Jerry, but he had been changed forever. We didn't know what to call it, but later it was given the label PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. I now believe after 15 years of watching his nightmares and watching him try to struggle through that stress, God indirectly used that traumatic stress to call me into the work of Army chaplaincy. And through my 28 years of chaplaincy, I had the honor of growing my own faith and increasing my own love by listening to thousands of war stories, some very difficult to hear and I'm sure a thousand times harder to share. It was 25 years after Jerry and his buddies came home from Vietnam that there came an obvious growth in their faith and an increase in their love. As a result of his best friend, Paul Reed, interesting that his name's Paul, the Apostle Paul is talking to us today, and Paul Reed had the experience of coming home and going through two marriages, two divorces, working through a number of jobs and losing them and signing up to be a truck driver, to drive trucks all the way across the country. And while he was driving those trucks across the country, he was called by his mom, and his mom said, Paul, do you want this bag you sent home 22 years ago during the war? Do you want this um, sack of stuff? And he said, yes, and he went home and found it. He opened the bag, and in it there was a diary, a diary of the soldier that they thought they killed, and he had the diary translated and come to find out it was love poems, love letters and poems and pictures of this man's children. And he came to realize, Paul came to realize, hey, this man's like me. He had love. He had a family. He had a wife. And as he had it translated, God began to work on him and heal him and help him to see this man as a person. And, and then he said, I've got to take this diary back to his widow. And so he worked through our country and their country and ended up in Hanoi. And, and as he was getting ready to go to the home of this widow, he discovered that this man is still alive. And he goes into this man's home and he meets the man who was once his enemy 25 years earlier. You can look it up. It's the Contum Diary. It's an Amazon sale. It's a PBS special. And he said, as he encountered his enemy, I discovered that the healing began. He wrote the experiences in that book called Contum Diary. He's writing another book to honor his mother who helped him find the healing and helped to get through that healing. That love, forgiveness, and love engulfed my brother-in-law during such things as his walk to Emmaus and the birth of his children and the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren. And even though his life was pretty much dominated by the PTSD, his skin cancer from exposure to Agent Orange, his nightmares and his congestive heart failure, he worked through hardship and learned how to laugh and love again. Even just a few weeks ago as he was in the Florence Hospital Responding to the nurses, he had discovered his sense of humor again. And even in his dying days, he would have fun as the nurses came in and said, Hey, Mr. Thomas, is there anything we can get you? And he would laugh and he would, um, yes, you can get me a million dollars. <laughs> and then he'd laugh and he said, I'm just kidding. I wouldn't know what to do with it anyway. And they would laugh. One day he was laying there just actually 72 hours before he died. In his medication moment, he said, where is Kay? That's my sister. 
His brother said, Kay went to the car. And Jerry said, well, here I am. We've been married over 52 years, and I'm up here dying, and she's left me. <laughs> and then he grinned and laughed, and he said, nah, I'm just kidding. I know she's not going to leave me. She loves me, and I love her. 72 hours later, he passed. October the 11th, just shortly after 1 p.m. And I thought, huh. That's when I was born, shortly after 1 p.m., October the 11th. He passed. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. For you see, whether it's birth, whether it's life, whether it's death, or life beyond death, we come together and we hear God saying to us through Paul. Paul Reed, the Apostle Paul, I thank God for you because your faith is growing, your love is increasing, and you are faithful in the hard times. Heavenly Father, for all the saints, we lift to you our praise and gratitude, our fathers, our mothers, our brothers, our sisters, our sons, our daughters, faith of our fathers and mothers. Thank you, Lord. They have brought us to this place and their faithfulness, the growth of their faith, and the increase of their love will take us on home. Bless us. In Jesus' name, amen.